Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume in September of 2021. This past week, uh, we opened registration for our SALT New York event, which is taking place at the brand new Javits Center expansion in New York in September. So we hope you can join us there. But our goal at those events and on these talks is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And if you're a regular here on SALT Talks, you know how keenly interested we are in the digital asset space. We're very excited to bring you the latest installment of our digital asset series with Zach Dexter. Uh, Zach is the CEO of LedgerX, which is the first US regulated Bitcoin options platform. Uh, Zach developed and scaled the platform and custody system and led all technical systems, market surveillance and control aspects of the company's uh, three and a half year exchange and clearinghouse regulatory approval process. Uh, Zach is now leading the next phase of, uh, of LedgerX's expansion into perpetual products, clearing for other exchanges and international services. Uh, prior to returning to LedgerX as CEO, uh, Zach led multiple engineering teams at Mirror, which is a highly successful direct-to-consumer fitness brand. Uh, prior to Mirror, Zach served as a CTO and co-founder at LedgerX. Uh, hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Anthony for the interview. Well, you, you got a super impressive career, Zach. And so I want you to start there. Take us back. Uh, where did you go to high school? Where did you end up at college? Why did you end up doing this for a living? Well, from Charlotte, North Carolina, I went to UNC Chapel Hill and was uh, was doing some software consulting almost straight out of college. All right. I love it. I'm, calling, I'm calling time out right now. Now I know why John Darcy has been so excited about this salt talk. I'm going to come out and say, I didn't even know you were I mean, Tar Heel, Zach. So this I mean, just, do we, we have anybody from Long Island that we, excuse me, excuse me. Do we have anybody from Long Island that we can bring on the salt talk? Can, can you give Billy Joel a call or something like that? Jesus. Zach, All right, just Zach, for the record, I grew, up, so, I grew up in Chapel Hill. I grew up in Chapel Hill. My brother lives in Charlotte. I, I'm in North Carolina right now, actually. So uh, this is fantastic. I love you even more, but go ahead. Yeah, it's a great place. Great place. So I went from there to New York and was doing software consulting for various startups and wanted to join something absolutely crazy that had like no chance at all of succeeding. And I thought, all right, yeah, Bitcoin derivatives exchange in 2013 is the thing. There's no way that this is going to get approved. Uh, you know, we're, we're all going to get a big trouble. I'm, I'm not, you know, but let's go for it. So I joined LedgerX as a co-founder and, and built the platform. We actually succeeded in getting the CFTC to give us uh, not only the exchange approval, but the, the required clearinghouse approval so we could hold Bitcoin. Okay, hold I want to stop you for a sec, Jack, not to interrupt, but I want you to explain to our viewers and listeners what LedgerX is and then take them through that process of getting the approvals. Yeah, yeah so we're a Bitcoin options platform. You can, you can buy calls, sell calls, buy puts, sell puts on physical Bitcoin. You can do some, some futures trading, we have a next day swap product that's kind of like spot. So any kind of Bitcoin derivative, you can trade on LedgerX. In fact, we're the only place uh, today in the United States where retail investors can trade physically settled Bitcoin options. So if you have a bunch of Bitcoin and you want to generate yield, you can sell calls on LedgerX. You can't do that anywhere else as a U.S. retail investor. So, so Jack, I have to ask this question. Can you buy and sell Bitcoin on an exchange in the United States? Yes. And that's Coinbase? Where else can you buy it? Gemini, Kraken, FTX US. There are a ton of platforms for spot trading. That's open and available to US investors. No problem. Easy to do. But the derivative space is, is much more uh, constricted. There are very few things you can do today in, in Bitcoin derivatives in the US as a retail investor. So is it fair to say that you're the only one that can do this or, or do you have competitors? We don't have anyone else doing physically settled Bitcoin options right now in the U.S. That's we're the only one, which is crazy because it's 2021. We've been around for a few years now. It's just so tough to get those licenses. 
And so I want you to then address in your words, the regulatory landscape for Bitcoin. And I had to put a flak jacket on this morning because of the comments that Senator Elizabeth Warren was making. I had a flak jacket on and a helmet like we were were heading into uh, some enemy fire. Yeah, I I think there is a lot of uh, a lot of misunderstanding on, on what the regulatory landscape is. It's actually not as bad as I think it's portrayed in in the media. So you've got the SEC and they're regulating security tokens and, and Bitcoin ETFs. You've got the CFTC, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, used to be an agricultural regulator. They've gotten into crypto asset regulation. Any derivative on Bitcoin, Ethereum, any derivative on any crypto, like a future, an option, a swap. That falls into the CFTC's bailiwick. So you've got the two financial regulators. The IRS has been chiming in with uh, how they're going to treat uh, crypto from a tax perspective. And we're starting to see a lot more regulatory clarity from the SEC, from the IRS, from some of these other federal agencies. But the CFTC has been in this game for five plus years now. They've had a super clear regime all along. So if you want to do derivatives, you know they're the place to go. And you also have something called a clearinghouse, and you're working with the other exchanges. Tell us what the clearinghouse is, and tell us tell us why it's important to your business. Yeah, clearing is uh, it is not really a well understood subject because it's so it's so new. Uh, after 2008, we had these these long chains of swap obligations. Nobody knew who owed what to whom. They were like 15, 20 hops long. It was impossible to track down what's the total outstanding risk of the financial system. So. Regulators in Congress got together and they said, all right, we're going to have a single entity control all that risk. So every buyer of a derivatives instrument is going to directly face a central counterparty. Every seller is going to directly face a central counterparty. And every time you do a trade, we're going to break that trade in two. So there, there's no concept anymore of, all right, let's let's face our counterparty directly. Uh, that, that results in a system where you really can't measure the total outstanding risk in the financial system. So a clearinghouse is a central counterparty for derivatives trades. You have to have a clearinghouse if you want to offer interesting retail derivatives products. So we had to register not only the exchange, uh, which which was tough, we had to register the clearinghouse, which was very tough. There are very few active clearinghouses in the U.S. Those those uh, the, the clearinghouses manage customer funds, they manage all the risk. So the regulators really have to make sure that if, if you're operating a clearinghouse, you've got your risk modeling uh, down pat. Okay, so it, it, it sounds like you've put all of the pieces together to build an amazing business. So tell us about the products that you're going to overlay on this business. Tell us about the future of Ledger X. I think I need to also disclose that early on, I was a seed round investor in the company. And so I'm very proud of you, Zach. You're doing a great job. Where, where are we going? Yeah, we were today. We've got the Bitcoin options. It's a it's a fully collateralized product. It's a little bit tough to trade uh, because there's no leverage. So what we want to do is take the most popular derivatives product from the overseas crypto world, which is the perpetual swap. It does most of the volume, most of the revenue, but you have to have our licenses to offer it here in the U.S. So we want to take that, copy paste it into the U.S., offer it on Ledger X initially on Bitcoin, Ethereum, but actually on. Uh, all commodities. It's it's a product that, in some cases, for some asset classes, is superior to traditional futures because you don't have to roll from expiration to expiration. There's no structural volatility like we saw with the oil price a few months ago, uh, concurrent with expiration. So, so this is the most popular traded instrument in crypto by far. It's probably the most successful product to come out of crypto. It's not crypto itself. It's actually this perpetual swap. So all this overseas trading that we're hearing about, most of that volume is taking place in the perpetual. But again, because of Dodd-Frank, you've got to have our licensing stack to offer that here. So U.S. investors can't trade the most popular product in crypto. We're going to fix that problem. Then we're going to take that to all asset classes and take a direct run at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and and Urex, who are are not structurally capable of of offering those products. So explain to our listeners that are Bitcoin skeptics crypto skeptics, et cetera, why you're not one of those people? I think at, at this point that there's, uh, it, it's a new asset class, it's here. And if you're, if you're a skeptic, it doesn't matter. Uh, there are enough people who are not that the asset class uh, is here to stay. So th- there's no point I think in, 
having a personal view on you know whether Bitcoin is is good or bad, the market has decided that it's a new asset class, and, and that's pretty much the long and, and short of the story. But there's also this aspect that uh, crypto introduces fundamental improvements in the financial plumbing that would not be possible if we were to rely on centralized infrastructure. Whether whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Ethereum or DeFi. Uh, the paradigm shift that's that's going on right now is we're taking systems that are actually terrible when you build them in a centralized manner, ACH, wire. Uh, this stuff is 40 years old. It barely works. It's held together by a bunch of duct tape. And we're replacing it with a modern alternative using blockchains. That's actually far better from a technological perspective than the centralized alternative, which is a bunch of different institutions trying to coordinate, you know, hey, who has my funds? Where's the transfer in progress? All that stuff is public on the blockchain. So it's, a, it's just a technological revolution. It's the new rails for the financial system. It's coming, you know, there's not gonna be as much change as I think some people think. We're not gonna live in a dystopian society uh, where people are out on the street, uh, you know, and, and there's been a, a nuclear war and we're, you know, using the Lightning Network to pay each other in Bitcoin. Like that, that's not where we're heading. Where we're heading is regulated institutions using crypto rails to move funds around, to do trading, everything we do today, but using a better technology. That's the best way to think of crypto. So you're, what you're really talking about, Zach, is what people describe as decentralized finance. And so it's a reduction of the middleman. It's likely a reduction of transaction costs. Um, there's an integrity to the system, and so there's some safety and surety, and it's almost like a direct-to-consumer business, if, if, if I'm not saying it correctly. And so what your exchange will be is for institutions and individuals to have investments in varying cri cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, et cetera, but then also have options and derivatives like they do in the stock and bond market. And so so why should we be super excited about Ledger X? Well, there's never been uh, there's never been a regulated version of what's going on in the overseas uh, crypto derivatives markets. And actually, those markets in many cases are more liquid, more efficient, more fun to trade in. They're better for institutions, better for retail. Uh, they have they have so much liquidity at at three a.m. because uh, they're open twenty four seven. The products are tradable twenty four seven. What's going on overseas is you've got a, a totally unregulated, but in many cases, better version of the financial markets that we have here. What we're doing is putting our US regulatory wrapper on that same technology. So you're gonna have the same kind of quality uh, in terms of execution quality, in terms of liquidity, in terms of asset class choice that you have overseas, but in the highly regulated jurisdictions. That's pretty much it. And when we talk about decentralized finance, LedgerX itself is a centralization node, if you will, a centralization network. So explain to us how LedgerX fits into that mosaic. Yeah, we're, we're totally centralized today, right? So we're doing centralized derivatives. You know, you have to send us money as, as collateral, post that to the clearinghouse in order to sell a call or in order to you know, buy a put. You've got to post the premiums and a wire transfer to the clearinghouse. But now, long term, I think what we're going to do, and we've already started working on this, is, is we're going to look to run our platform on DeFi rails. So we're going to take our regulatory wrapper, take our controls, the oversight, and we're going to use DeFi technology uh, to run the exchange, to run the clearinghouse. And it's actually a more efficient way to do things. So you know, when we talk about crypto and whether it's good or bad or here to stay, I think the way to look at it is, all of these centralized institutions today, whether it's you know banks, even central banks in some cases, uh, exchanges, clearinghouses, brokers, all of those entities are going to move towards a world where they're kind of nodes in this decentralized network, and we're going to be one of those nodes. But today, you know, it's a totally centralized operation. We've got to ease into that uh, that future vision. I I have a, a, a worry. It's a worry that I share with uh, lots of people about the future of regulation here in the United States and around the world. And so tell me uh, why I shouldn't be worried or tell me what I should be worried about. I think, um, I think a lot of the responsibility for 
uh, making sure we get the right kind of regulation actually falls on the industry. And what I mean by that is it's incredible. You know, when I, when I go talk to our regulators, there's, there are very few people who are approaching U.S. federal regulators with good crypto ideas. Most people are trying to get around the regulatory regime entirely. Most people are trying to, you know, skirt the rules. And that, that's not the way you want to do things. If you want good crypto regulation, you've got to go to the regulators and say, look, here's a solid argument for why we should be allowed to use DeFi technology. And, you know, we're going to have all these consumer protections. Uh, here is our disaster recovery plan, our business continuity plan. You know, here's all the, all the paperwork you need to see. Here's what we're doing. Here's why it works. You know, please sign off on that. Or, or at least tell us where we can improve, you got to engage. And I think that the biggest worry for me is not that there's going to be excessive regulation, it's that the industry is going to continue to try to skirt all the, all the rules, and they're not going to be there to engage in a two-way dialogue with the regulators. That's the most dangerous thing that I, I think uh, crypto is facing right now. John Darcy, fellow Tar Heel. I know you went to Emory, but you see yourself as a Tar Heel. I mean, who's kidding who? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and by the like way, said, Zach, if you ask a really Hill, good, Zach, two of Zach, my uh, siblings, a really good, I'm talking over Darcy. I don't care. Zach, if he asks a really good question, don't say, oh, that's a really good question. Okay. Can you promise me that, Zach? I'm one of your investors, yep. Zach. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Darcy. As much as I want to just talk about Carolina basketball, I'm going to continue uh, on the current topic. But um, okay. perpetual swaps, could you talk a little bit more about uh, why those exist overseas, why they're not as popular in the United States, how they yeah. work, and just more of the mechanics around them? Yeah, it's like a traditional future, but it's a lot more fun to trade. The reason is it's really simple. Essentially, it's a leverage spot product. So everybody wants to trade crypto, right? And a lot of people want to trade it on leverage. The easiest conception, the most simple conception of a leveraged crypto product is the perpetual swap. It's a future that doesn't have an expiration date. So there's no, you know, it's, hey, it's March 28th, futures are gonna roll off, you got a leg into another future, and in the following month, uh, you gotta have a trading team for that, it's, it's a pain in the butt. So essentially, it's just a way to get leverage spot exposure. It's super simple. Uh, the other aspect of the perpetual future that I think is not as well understood by the, the public at this point is the, uh, the margin model behind it. So. It turns out that overseas, the way these things trade and the way they're margined, you get liquidated super fast if your position goes underwater. Here in the US, all of the margin lending at the brokers and the clearing houses, most of it is recourse lending. So people can come after your house if you can't you know, come through on your, on your margin obligations at your broker with the clearing house. Overseas, uh, the, the way things work, if you go underwater, you get liquidated instantly. So it, it's actually, uh, lower risk to, uh, to trade and, and to clear than traditional futures, traditional options. So there, there's the kind of retail facing benefit, which is you don't have to roll from expiration to expiration. There's less structural volatility for that reason. So it's, it's good to trade, but actually on the back end from the technology side, from the clearing side, from the margin side, for the regulated entities or unregulated entities managing this stuff, it's it's less risky and you're, you're less likely to blow up uh, the financial system or you know your your account balance uh, in some cases, or you know the exchange you're trading at, if all they're doing is non recourse uh, margin perpetuals, which is super unintuitive, and you got to dig into the margin model to see why that's the case. But but actually, it's a better product from both the trading and the margin side. What levels of leverage are available internationally? You hear a lot of stories about just crazy wild west types of leverage that are available in places like Asia. And how does that compare to leverage that's available in, in crypto markets in the United States? Yeah, I mean, effectively, there's there's really at scale, it can only do like three to five X, even internationally. There, there is 100 X leverage available, but it's for like a $400 position. And, it, you know, <laughs> when 100 X leverage, the second the market moves, you get liquidated. And, you know, you, you lose whatever, uh, $5 plus the liquidation fee, or, or maybe there's a violent move and you lose all of it, but you only risk 400 bucks, right? right. So, so who cares, right? So I, I think here... Typically, the initial margin requirements on CME for trading are like you know ten to thirty percent. There's some variation margin. Uh, you, you get a message and it's like, hey, give me some more margin. You got to send a wire transfer. It's just so inefficient. Overseas, you get liquidated fast, and you got to you got to post that variation margin with stablecoins really, really fast. So it's a more efficient market, the safer market. The longer you have an underwater position outstanding, like over here at CME, you can have an 
underwater position overnight, you know, it's not good. Um, the more risk there is for the system. So actually, in terms of regulation, we should be looking at some of the improvements that the uh, the overseas market has made in terms of the margining systems uh, and in terms of the liquidation systems that they're using. It's it's some incredible stuff. So obviously, Bitcoin uh, and several several other cryptocurrencies just experienced real significant drawdowns in the last month, month and a half. Uh, a lot of talk has been about how much leverage is in the system and how much of that was an unwinding of leverage and liquidation right. of, of different positions that people took. In your view, in your study of crypto markets and of Bitcoin, how much of that was a deleveraging event? And, and where do you see Bitcoin now in terms of the health, uh, you know, in terms of how much leverage is in the system? Yeah, there was a ton of leverage in DeFi. A lot of people have been wrapping their Bitcoins and depositing them into wrapped Bitcoin and putting them on Aave and then taking loans out against that and borrowing Tether and depositing that, taking more loans out. And they're leveraging over and over again. But actually, the amazing thing about that crash was that was a, a VAR shock, like a, a shock to the system that we, we haven't really experienced in traditional financial markets. I mean, has there been a case where, how many cases can you name where there's been like a 30 to 6% across the board drawdown in commodities and the system survived, you know, like in 24 to 48 hours. That's that's incredible. What actually happened is everybody got liquidated on DeFi, but the system survived. And many of these protocols like Aave, Perpetual Protocol, a lot of them didn't even dig into their default fund. They didn't even have to go to their backstop. Everybody got liquidated and there was a buyer for all the liquidated positions in many cases, despite the size of the shock. So it was this really interesting dynamic where all the centralized exchanges like went down, you know, the price started tanking, uh, all the centralized exchanges, except for Ledrex, of course, were down. Um, I think, you know, FTX might've been up uh, and, as they usually are, but, FTX but most of these guys- down, yeah, FTX exactly. never goes down. There you go. But but most of these guys tanked, right? And, and DeFi did not, DeFi was online, which was extremely interesting. And not only were they online because it's decentralized, they didn't dig into their reserve fund. If you had that kind of shock in the traditional markets, you would have blown out the clearinghouse default fund. You would have mutualized the loss. So there's something to be to be learned actually from from the volatility. It's it's not always a bad thing. Right. You know, it, it was a stress test that the DeFi uh, space passed, and I, that's a great point yeah. that you make. That it's it's very positive to see it survive uh, that type of volatility and emerge uh, still in a healthy state. So we were talking before we went live about El Salvador. So recently, the president of El Salvador threw his weight behind Bitcoin. He introduced a bill uh, into the legislature there in El Salvador um, to make Bitcoin legal tender. It passed with a supermajority. It looks like Bitcoin is going to be legal tender in El Salvador. What do you think that news does? Obviously, El Salvador is a small country. It has, a, I think it's 103rd in global nominal GDP. What do you think that move is going to have, uh, what type of effect it's going to have, maybe a domino effect around the world? And what are the implications of that move in your mind? Yeah, the question is, is it the micro strategy buy, you know, where there's like one buy and then there aren't a lot of other buys? Or is it the, the start to a cascading, you know, buy event for, for central banks and sovereign wealth funds? I have no idea. But I will say that there's a decent chance, in my opinion, that this thing overtakes gold because it is a better gold in many ways. And I think, I think it does go, you know, it does go to the gold market cap, maybe beyond uh, it's, it's, it's more fungible. It's easier to send. You can use it as collateral. Like at Ledger X, we're going to allow people to post Bitcoin as collateral for other types of derivatives transactions. You can't really ship us a gold bar. We're like, Hey, you know, Zach, let me ship you like 10 gold bars to like cover my oil trade. Like, how are you going to do that? That's, that's actually tough. One of the problems with the gold, um, you can send Bitcoin like this. So it's it's a more useful gold. It's a better gold. From that perspective, you should expect that you know to the extent that it continues to gain legitimacy every day it's alive, it does that. Uh, there's a higher probability that central banks, sovereign wealth funds, you know, treasuries will will start to adopt this as a reserve asset. So it, I, I actually think it's not the micro strategy buy. I think it's it's more of a a start to a cascading event. It's going to be a trickle and then probably turn into a flood. And you know the thing will probably will probably replace gold in, in the end. So simple as that. And I want to interrupt, think, John. Though I want to yeah, ask about the volatility. Though you're not worried about the volatility. Gold is not as volatile as Bitcoin. I think it's just due to how young Bitcoin is. I mean, gold as a reserve asset has been around for thousands of years, and Bitcoin, uh, you know, a dozen or so. So 
I think that that gets smoothed out. And the reason is, you know, mo- I think most of the volatility is going to shift to some of the, uh, some of the stuff further out on the risk curve, like, like DeFi, you know, it's going to show up in Solana. It's going to show up in Ethereum. It's going to show up in uh, the ERC 20 tokens that are doing a lot of the lending. Um, that's where the volatility is going to shift because Bitcoin has, has, has started to say, all right, here's my purpose. I'm digital gold, right? Ethereum is starting to say, here's my purpose. I'm the best smart contract platform. Solana is saying, well, I'm a, I actually am a competing smart contract platform that has XYZ advantages. So you're starting to see a divergence of crypto. And I think you're, they're, they're going to be less correlated over time. And you'll see a lot of volatility in the stuff further out of the risk curve. But in Bitcoin, you know, it, it's probably going probably gonna to decrease over time. Do you think Ledger X has a path to, and you've already gotten there uh, with some of the licenses that you guys have uh, in terms of the exchange that you operate. Do you think you're sort of a happy medium between full on DeFi, where you have all these wrapped, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, wrapped stocks, wrapped commodities? Um, you know, are you guys sort of a bridge to a fully decentralized financial system in the United States? Or how do you view yourself yeah. uh, relative to other pure DeFi plays? Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to have a truly fully decentralized financial system. I think we're going to have uh, DeFi rails, but there's always going to be a need for you know, transferring your assets to your beneficiaries when you die, right? There's always going to be a need for recovering your private keys if something happens to you or if you, you lose them or your house, you know, experience a house fire, like basic stuff like this, it doesn't work right now in DeFi. And that's a huge problem. So you know, when people are, are thinking about whether the financial system is going to be decentralized, like step back a minute, We've been in this massive bull market for financial intermediaries for like whatever, 100 years. Uh, and they're, they're not just going to go away overnight because they actually do serve a purpose in many cases. I mean, it, it, in a lot, of, a lot of cases, they're just extracting rent. Uh, but in other cases, they're helping consumers you know, recover their assets. Um, and, and you don't want to turn the, the economy into like a bearer bond economy. And, and you know, if your house gets burnt down, if you die, it all disappears. So you've got to have a way to inject these third-party services onto the DeFi rails. And those third-party services are going to be banks. They're going to be, you know, the backup key for your wallet. Uh, JP Morgan is probably going to come in there and, and help you transfer your, your assets to your beneficiaries, even if this stuff does take over. So I think the financial intermediaries stick around, but they do different things. And same with us. So we're going to be there as an exchange, as a clearinghouse. I don't think those regulatory conceptions are going away. But actually, from a tech, uh, technology perspective, those two things work better in DeFi. So the DeFi implementation of a bank, implementation of a clearinghouse is better, strictly better than the centralized implementation, but there's still that you know, customer support aspect, right? So it's not gonna be everybody for themselves, pull out your Ledger Nano and you know, put all your wealth on there. I, I don't think that's where this, this ends. Right. Why have you guys made the strategic decision to let competing exchanges work with your platform uh, as opposed to purely trying to pump the Ledger X exchange? Yeah, I mean, it's really simple. For 30 years now, people have been trying to compete with the established exchanges in the US and, and everybody fails. Everyone's like, hey, I've got a new product. I'm going to list it. Uh, it's, it's some exotic product. Uh, and, and the traditional guys are not going to be able to adapt. Of course they will. You know, they have a huge regulatory moat. They have a lot of market power. They're going to list anything you list. So you have to, you have to come at the competitive landscape in the US and derivatives from the clearing angle. If you, if you go there with a new product, you try to list it on an exchange, you're gonna get run over every time. So what you gotta do is what the big boys do. You gotta build up a large network of exchanges that work with your clearing house and offset the collateral requirements for trading on any of those exchanges with positions on any of the other exchanges. It's called cross market. Basically, that means to trade any product, you know, instead of posting 20% initial margin, if you're on exchange X and that exchange is clearing through Ledger X, you can use your positions on Exchange Y, which is also clearing through Ledger X, and don't, you don't have to post that initial margin. So it's more capital efficient to trade. No one has successfully set up that community of exchanges that are working together to uh, give the traders a, a, the benefit of a lower initial margin requirement. So that's a, that's a technical thing. It's in the weeds, but that's why no one has succeeded in competing with the big established players in the US for such a long time. We're now clearing for four exchanges which is crazy to me. You know, a year ago, we were clearing for just our, our own exchange. We've since signed up three others. Um, it, it's, it's a big deal because no one has done that uh, really since the demutualization is of, of CBO, as far as I can tell. Right. 
And geographically, you know, there's a lot of concentration of, you know, Bitcoin and crypto trading in Asia, for example, definitely outside the United States. You have exchanges like FTX, like Binance, uh, plenty of other examples that are based in Asia because they've been able to operate more freely. Um, but now you see China cracking down on Bitcoin, basically lifting all mining out of the country in addition to banning the use of cryptocurrencies for exchange or investment in China. Um, you have India that's mulling over how they're going to regulate Bitcoin, even though they've now said it's not going to be a full on ban. Do you see the balance of power as it relates to crypto trading, crypto mining, moving westward uh, to places like the United States, especially as CFTC and, and SEC start to get more comfortable with certain elements of uh, you know, DeFi and, and crypto? Yeah, I, I call it the regulatory flipping. I think it's it's ongoing right now. A lot of the exchanges that are uh, that we're operating out of jurisdictions in Asia, Asia are, are seeing those jurisdictions start to clamp down and they're saying, hey, you know, where do I go? And my answer is you got to register, like go to the regulator, you fill out the paperwork. It's actually not that bad. It just takes a while for them to review your application and, you know, make sure you're doing all the right stuff, which you should probably be doing anyway. Um, and say, look, hey, you know, can you please accelerate this? We're, we're trying to get to market. It's not a bad process. That's my message to the industry. If crypto wants to succeed, we have to work with the regulators, not work against them. You don't want to be antagonistic and say, hey, can I have an exemption from all the laws that apply to everyone else? They're not going to give that to you. So you've, you've got to be proactive. And I think we see more and more of that, more and more people registering, applying for licenses. You know, it's, it's a good thing in general, because the, the more engagement there is, the, the more of a like two-sided dialogue there is, the regulators can figure out, okay, this is what's safe, this is what's not, here's who's legit, here's who's not. And things start to move faster and the whole thing um, becomes better lubricated. So I think you do see people moving into uh, more respectable jurisdictions over time. It's as simple as that. I think that all plays out over the next 12 to 18 months. So as Anthony mentioned, our sort of house view is that the biggest threat to Bitcoin and crypto is always going to be regulation. You know, you might not be able to completely stop Bitcoin, but if if the United States, for example, decided to come down with heavy handed regulation, whether it would be taxation or an outright ban or whatever it may be, obviously it would it would have a detrimental impact to the momentum that, that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have. But do you think that, that Bitcoin specifically and, and other cryptocurrencies to a certain extent have released uh, have reached a point of regulatory capture in the United States, whereby you have pensions, endowments, wealth management companies, uh, corporate balance sheets own this asset to the point where uh, they almost face no choice but to regulate it in a constructive way. You know, I I, I don't think it's regulatory capture. In fact, I can tell you it's not because our our regulators still give us give us a uh, an appropriately tough time. You know, whenever we want to do something new, so I, I think that's a good thing. It's healthy. But it's, it's definitely not captured, though. <laughs> so I, my view is the, the biggest threat to Bitcoin is, is not regulation. It's Bitcoin itself. Like, how do you construct the narrative? What good is this doing for the world? Why is it better than the fiat system? You know, what are the, the guardrails that consumers actually need? Because consumers, you know, they do need guardrails. You, you don't want to be holding your private keys. You don't want to live in a world where, you know, everybody has no recourse. No one has any recourse if they lose their assets. Uh, and, and they've got their little hardware wallet. They lose it. That's it. You know, now now their life savings are gone. That's not a good thing. So there, there's a reasonable way to engage with regulators. It's important that people start doing that. In the U.S., people have tried to, you know, file for no action relief on on every regulation in the book. It's not productive. So my message to the industry would be: get out there, start talking to the regulators, and start applying for licenses. It's it's a totally reasonable process, and it will become more reasonable the more you do it. So, so Bitcoin Warren, is the greatest threat to itself. Yeah. Elizabeth Warren, who's obviously been a, a tough cop when it comes to financial regulation, has, has recently come out with the most aggressive words yet that she's had about cryptocurrencies, basically stating her intent to root them out of the U.S. financial system. At the same time, she's a big critic of Wall Street and of big banks, which yeah. uh, I would say a lot of Bitcoiners think that Bitcoin presents a compelling alternative to the traditional banking system. How do you she also She also hides behind her staff when she... <laughs> departs or boards or deplanes from a private plane. That's fine. Keep going, John. Right. But how do you uh, view, you know, sort of the politiciz politicization of Bitcoin? Are you worried at all about this becoming a, you know, perceived right versus left type of issue? Or what message would you yeah. have for Elizabeth Warren if she was tuning into the salt talk, which I can guarantee you she is not? <laughs> 
Well, I, I am definitely worried about it becoming a, a partisan issue. I think that would be a, a huge mess. Uh, and there's no reason it has to become a partisan issue because it's just a new technology. And the technology has, has you know, properties that are arguably not as environmentally unfriendly as has been has been portrayed. So I, I totally disagree on, on that part. You know, I, I think it's it's not burning up the world's carbon resources in the way that uh, people have depicted. Um, and in addition, the great irony here is the more we disempower the crypto community, the more we empower the established banking incumbents. And those incumbents are extracting a huge deal of rent from everyday Americans through overdraft fees, through wire transfer fees, you know, ACH fees, fees for this, fees for that. And, you know, I'm going on Aave and I'm taking out a loan in Tether or USDC for, for whatever, 3%. And no one is uh, banging down the door. No loan charts are banging down the door trying to repossess my house. But if you did that in the traditional financial system, I guarantee you all you would be dealing with uh, are, are regulated loan sharks. So you've got to be really careful because you've got this new empowering technology and to the extent that you try to overregulate that, you're actually going to end up creating a huge moat for the, the established incumbents. And, and so I look at that criticism, you know, in some ways, and I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, there's only one way uh, that you can get on board with, uh, with overregulating crypto. And, and that's if you're trying to preserve the, you know, monopoly oligopoly that these established incumbents have on financial services. And that's not a good thing for the American people, right? So there's a happy medium here. Uh, the, the extremes are, are not gonna give us the answer uh, on either side are not gonna give us any good answers here. Right. Well, Zach, it's been a pleasure to have you on Salt Talks. Anthony, you have a final word for Zach before we let him go? No, we're super excited about your business, Zach. Uh, wish you the best of luck. We'll see you at our conference in September. And uh, I like your optimistic view of where things are going. We, we, we agree. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. And thank you, everybody, for tuning into today's Salt Talk with Zach Dexter of LedgerX, who uh, very forward thinking in terms of uh, crypto exchanges and, and the clearing process of, uh, of all kinds of different commodity assets in the United States. Uh, just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous Salt Talks, you can access them on our website on demand at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. We're also on social media at Salt Conference is where we're most active, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And please spread the word about these Salt Talks. Uh, we love educating people about a variety of different topics here on, on Salt Talks, uh, but particularly we think exciting things are happening in the digital asset space and love bringing new people uh, into the fold of that asset class. But on behalf of Anthony and the entire Salt team, this is John Darcy signing off from Salt Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon. 